Hello and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I'm pleased to introduce you to John Saunders. John spent many years as a Wall Street senior vice president, sales team leader, and award-winning sales executive. Must have gotten a couple of trips out of that, I'm guessing. Uh, <laughs> he followed his passion for helping others grow and founded a coaching and consulting company, Forward Advisory Solutions. He's also the author of The Optimizer, Building and Leading a Team of Serial Innovators. Here to talk about that book and so much more is my guest, John Saunders. Welcome to the program, John. Great to be here, Mike. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you here. And John, I'm going to ask you the same question I ask everybody as we start these conversations, which is, where does your story begin? Where does it begin? You know, I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's, you know, you, you don't know what cold is till you live up there for a bunch of years. But when you only, <laughs> when you only know that, that's all you know, right? And uh you know, uh, my parents always got us, they got us all investing, their three children investing very early. And so I always had this interest in investing in money and this kind of thing. And so get done with college, had an opportunity to move out to New York City. I took it, started right out of school with a company and, you know, as an assistant, you know, sending faxes, remember what faxes were mm -hmm. and <laughs> this kind of thing. And 23 years later, uh, I'm, you know, running this $4 billion division uh, as a senior vice president of the organization. It was really a lot of fun. And then we got sold. The firm was acquired in 2019 and had a pretty good deal to leave. So I exercised that option. And then what to do next? Right? <laughs> uh, after 23 years with the same business card that just changed titles, I had to figure out what to do next. And I got some great advice along the way. Uh, someone said, why don't you go write something? Write a paper on leadership, put it on LinkedIn or something like this. And I thought, that's a good idea. I write it, shared it with a few friends, went through several iterations. Suddenly it was a series. And Another friend, another person in my massive networking journey during that period, 2019 said, you know, go immerse yourself in something. And if you want to figure out what to do next, she said, go immerse yourself in something and your value proposition will manifest itself. And Mike, I vividly remember thinking like, what are you Yoda? I don't get this at all. And, uh, <laughs> and sure enough, uh, I started writing, I started going to all these events, you know, live right before this is just before COVID and I'm at this event. And this guy, it was a pitch event and this guy pitches his company and I went up to him at the break and said, wow, cool story. You know, tell me more about it. I asked him all these questions and about 15, 20 minutes into the conversation, he looks at me and he goes, could we hire you to do that? And I was like, do what? And he goes, uh, be our coach. I was like, oh, I was just asking you questions. And I didn't realize the value and how that was something that I do very naturally. So uh, they were my first client, found a few more was introduced to a book author coach uh, around right before Christmas 2019. They wrote my book 2020, and it just continues to grow from there, uh, from coaching with executive leaders, as well as working with uh, executive authors that come through the coaching program. Yeah. So when, when you were writing that book, what were some of the, um, what did surprise you most about sort of either the writing process or the publishing process? Um, cause I imagine, you know, you had been writing, sounds like some content before some professional content, some coaching content, writing a book is kind of a different animal. Um, what surprised you about that process? What did you learn most about yourself from that process? Uh, a couple questions in there. Uh, I think with the, the writing process, I think I would say structure is important. It's about balancing structure and story. And when I wrote my book and was promoting it, and I did a, a very successful pre-sale, I'm happy to report, which I did not anticipate. I told my wife, I was like, we're going to be spending a lot of money in this. I'll try this pre-sale thing and see how it goes and over-raise the publishing cost, which was awesome. But I had people reach out to me, Mike, that were like, I've been writing a book for one, three, five years. And I'm on chapter three. Like, how did you get this done? And it's about having that structure, those, that, that guidance, that coaching, those sort of guardrails. And so that was a big learning lesson for me because when I was writing those papers, it took way too long because I didn't have that. I was just kind of writing and didn't have an editor. And so having that structure was super important to me in the writing journey. Uh, I think part two of that question was what did I learned about myself that I get. Yeah. Um, that I can stay up really late at night and not sleep that much and still get up <laughs> the next morning and function. <laughs> I had to write. I, I, it took... I, it really takes immense silence for me to write, like so, super focused. And sometimes it would take me an hour to get into the writing mode. And I got better kind of preparing myself so that hour wasn't quite as long, that blank screen thing, right? And, uh, but it, oftentimes once you get into the zone, you know, I'd sit in this chair at nine o'clock at night and suddenly it's two in the morning and it felt like five minutes went past. So 
being able to get in that zone, it sometimes, it's, I guess I learned how to better do that over time is probably what I learned best, which just takes more preparation. Yeah. It's like, it's like a, it's like a muscle, right? I think writing, I mean, writing is an action. It, it is a, a verb, you know, just like exercise. And, you know, the, the more you, you know, the more you exercise, the better you get at it. Right. So that the more lung capacity you have, yeah. um, I think writing's the same. It's like the more, the more you write, you know, the, the more you strengthen that muscle, you know, the better you become at it, at it and the easier it, it is to get into that zone. But also just having a better idea of what I want to write about that night and kind of crafting a little bit of an outline. So, because if I didn't, and I had to start sort of researching or starting that chapter, that story that night, that's when that sort of 30 minutes staring at the blank screen would show up <laughs> and you get really anxious, right? This whole thing. So I tried, that still happened, but I tried to decrease that as much as I could. And it seemed to get better over time. Yeah. One, some advice that I got really early on in my writing journey is, um, is to, to work with an outline, you know, even with, even with fiction, because if you have a sense of where the story is going to go and, and kind of what the beats are and, and where the, the twist might come, um, you know, you, you just have an easier time getting the words on the page versus always starting with sort of that blank sheet of paper. Um, and, and importantly, and I know some authors who say, you know, I don't want to be handcuffed by, by having an outline. And what I always say is that, you know, outlines are not handcuffs because I, even though I outline everything I write, that outline changes, you know, things change because as, as I learn the characters more, as, as the story sort of evolves, um, you know, I know that, you know, here it says I'm supposed to take a left turn, but I know that I can take that right turn. And sometimes if I make that right turn, it's going to be a better story. So um, I'm, I'm a big advocate of, um, of writing, writing with an outline and investing the time in putting that outline together. I would argue writing creation is innovation. You're bringing something new to the world and the way it happens most effectively is with some kind of a guidepost. And it's not to say, take a right turn or a left, not, not avoid that right or left turn where you find something interesting, but I think you can't really maximize innovation and creation until you have some kind of a boundary set for yourself. I mean, use a sports analogy, right? Put a bunch of guys out on a huge grass field and tell them to go play football, right? Well, wait a minute, where do we start? Where do we stop? Where's, you know, how do we score, right? You've got to have some kind of structure to get it started. And I think there's an interesting parallel for books and innovation. Yeah. Well, tell me, what's your, what's your fascination with innovation? Because I mean, I hear, you know, you spent a very long time in Wall Street. When I think Wall Street, I, I don't necessarily think innovation, you know, I think, and then that's probably my own bias coming out of, you know, earlier in my career, I worked in the internet industry and we were innovating. We we're innovating what we're doing right now, which is having conversations online face to face on, on webcam. But, you know, with with innovation, I think of consumer packaged goods companies coming up with new products. So where did where did this fascination of innovation and, and you know, and just ripping that off right from the subtitle of your book, you know, uh, leading a team of serial innovators? Where, when did you get fascinated with with innovation? What's what's fascinating about that story for me is that I never knew that I was fascinated with innovation. It, it's happened sort of organically. And the question I always ask is, uh, this is actually goes back to my undergraduate years. There was a class I took that the, the, it was history of the economic history, economic history of the U S and the question you always had to answer was, was it effective and was it efficient? And we analyzed all these decisions over the history of, of the US uh, and was it efficient, was it effective? And I've constantly asked myself that question, right? So, so I don't think, you know, we often think of innovation as products and goods and technology. I would argue innovation is just constant improvement and hence the name of my book, the, the Optimizer. And if you can figure out a way to better execute, I think that's innovation. If you can figure out a way to improve a product, that's innovation, no matter what it is, if it's an investment product or something else. And so as I went through my career on Wall Street, I constantly looked around and said, how can I fix this? How can I create more value here? And it doesn't have to be a radical change. It can be something more marginal, but if you can continue to build on that, <clears throat> excuse me, it can, it can add up to something significant over time. And more importantly, as a leader, and this is where the subtitle comes from, if I can get my team to think that way, they can not be afraid of change, which is many times what stifles change, and two, not face this emotional hurdle that stops you from fighting change because you're always making marginal change. And so that's really the sort of construct of the book is finding that, that overcoming that emotional burden of change as a leader, because you need to make it happen. 
Uh, but it's hard for people, you know, you're an outlier if you face, particularly on Wall Street, if you're the guy who's always saying, hey, how do we do this differently? You're an outlier. And that's a very small percentage. And I think a lot of industries are like that. So how, you, how, you, how, are you, how do you as a leader create that environment where people are constantly focusing on in incremental change and the benefits yeah. of that? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, you know, because I, I, in my career, I was a little bit ahead of the game doing uh, market research interviews um, online, you know, versus doing them in person, because that's the, you know, that's the sort of the gold standard is right. Running a focus group with people like in, in three cities over the course of a week or, um, you know, telephone interviews, things like that. About 10 or so years ago, I was working with a firm out of Cincinnati and they were having me do these phone interviews. And I'm like, why are we doing these over the phone? Like, why? And like, it would be so much better if I could see the person who I'm talking to. They're like, well, we don't have, you know, the budget to do this in person. And I'd be like, well, no, we could do this over webcam. And at the time, you know, the tool that we'd use was an Adobe product called Adobe Connect. I'm like, we'll get an Adobe Adobe license. We'll set this up. Um, we'll be face to face. And that way, when we show somebody something, I, I don't have to email it to them. They could just see it on the screen by screen sharing. And I would approach clients with this and be like, we've never done anything like this before. Um, we're a little hesitant to do that. And I kept thinking to myself, oh my goodness, this is, you're, you're not thinking, you're not thinking about where the puck is going to be at that point in time, right? To, to paraphrase from Wayne Gretzky. Um, and it would frustrate me that, that the, the, the response, we've never done it that way before, therefore we're not going to try it, was probably the most frustrating thing I've ever experienced in, in my business career. One of my favorite uh, interviews for my book was a Microsoft executive. And when I first wrote the book, I thought it was going to be about financial services, given my background. And I started to go sort of a bit outside and adjacent, you know, to other leaders, different industries. And as I kept going further and further, I realized this isn't a financial services book. This is a leadership book. So I'm interviewing this guy. And he said, when he comes into a new organization or a new leadership role, if, if someone says, this is how we've always done it, you know, his answer was, that's the first place I look to make change. <laughs> you know, not dead set on making that change, but that's the first place I'm going to give a real hard look to. And so couldn't agree with you more on that one. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a, it's like a cultural, you know, it's a cultural cancer to, to think like that in my, in my, you know, not to insult cancer. Um, but in, the, in, in my mind, I, I agree with your, uh, with your Microsoft exec. So, so tell me about the publishing process for you, um, for getting this book out there. You mentioned a pre-sale um, and the kind of beating, um, beating a number that you needed to, to, to beat. Um, tell me a little bit more about that. Sure. Uh, so you go through uh, the coaching service I went through. It was uh, five or six months of writing the manuscript. And so it's weekly sessions. You know, uh, it's all on Zoom. So it's ironic as I know all these people through that program. I've never been in the same room as one of them, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Uh, not once because it was all during the pandemic. And and then at the midway point, you got this rough draft manuscript. It's all done, you know, 40-ish thousand words, give or take. That's about a 200 and 250 page book. Uh, <clears throat> then you get introduced to a publisher and you can choose that publisher or not, or, you know, submit your book to them or not. And then the publisher, I did, they make it very easy for that to happen. Uh, and then the publisher approved my book. And then they, you literally launch into a pre-sale campaign that they coach you through. And there are a variety of ways to get it done. Uh, this was a crowdsourcing one. It uh, was sort of the lead story at the time when I did it. And I'll vividly remember sitting down with my wife uh, a week or so before I had to sign this contract. And it was, uh, I think it was it's about six or $7,000. And I sat down with her and I was like, there's this fundraiser thing. I don't think I'm going to raise all this money. So probably gonna have to write a check for like three or $4,000 to get this done. You know, I just wanted to sort of have a conversation about that before I wrote the sign this contract. <laughs> Fast forward, I went through the process. I took their coaching and advice and it raised $11,000. I sold 250 copies of my book before six months before it was published. Mm -hmm. And that was awesome. Then you move into the publishing phase. It goes to an acquiring editor, uh, what they call a marketing revisions editor. You work with this person every week as you fine tune the journey, uh, fine tune the, ch the chapters. But more importantly, once they get to the first layer of kind of polishing through the, this marketing revisions editor and acquiring editor, you send it back to your pre-sale buyers and say, hey, here's chapter one. What do you think? And they have very structured questions. You ask them very simple questions, uh, three questions you ask them and you get this feedback and then you take that feedback and you polish it again. And then you go back to this, your editor and they kind of polish it a bit more. And you have this back and forth sort of wash, rinse, repeat uh, as you kind of go through that. And then eventually get to copy editing, proofreading and layout and all these things. But it's a very much, 
it's it, it, it's a wash, rinse, repeat cycle. It's about polishing over and over again. And at the end, you, I think you have a pretty solid book and then cover design, um, very comprehensive, a lot of fun and a lot of moving parts to manage. Mm. I, don't know, I don't know how you would do it alone. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's one thing I've learned about the writing process is it's, um, you know, you could write the book alone, but everything else that comes after that. Um, and when I say write it alone, I mean, just kind of getting the words on the paper and, and getting your ideas out there. But, but the, the collaboration, obviously that can't happen uh, in a vacuum. You need, you need those editors and those beta readers to, um, to make your work as good as it can be. But you, know, you mentioned sort of a $7,000 contract. So you had to raise that $7,000 before publication. And if, if you didn't, you know, you're on the hook for the difference. Is that, is that right? Or. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or you could walk away. Uh, right. And give so, everyone their money back, which I don't think anybody wants to do. That. Nobody wants to do that. Right. <laughs> nobody wants that. I was talking to um, uh a woman a few weeks ago who won a Pulitzer prize for her um, for one of her books, her first book. And she told me this interesting story about how when she wrote that first book, she had no idea what she was doing. You know, she was a historian sort of by by academic training. And when she sent the first few chapters into her, you know, the, the editor of um, of her the publisher that she was, you know, had this contract with, they canceled her contract right away because um, they Ouch. realized that she didn't know what she was doing. Um, and, and, you know, and which, and she freely admits that she didn't know what she was doing, but she's like, I had, they, they paid me a hefty advance. So I had to pay that advance back to them. Hmm. But then she had, then she had this mindset where, whereas I think some people would say, okay, I'm done failed experiment. Um, and she's like, no, I'm going to learn how to do this the right way. And she actually wound up, even though she was writing nonfiction biography, she studied how to write mysteries and thrillers because those are what get people sort of turning the page. And then she, when she started approaching this biography differently, um, you know, it was, it was kind of gangbusters, but you need that feedback. You know, you need, you need to hear from somebody. And sometimes the news has to be difficult. You know, if she didn't get that news, you know, if she didn't have that contract canceled, she may never have gotten the, you know, the, um, yeah, the, the motivation to, to become a better writer. Um, so I don't know why I went off on that tangent, but something you said reminded me of that story. <laughs> well, I think just the process and having all these sort of partners and accountability people along the way to get you through it. And I'll tell you what, it is, there's also this moment of, um, discovery. You asked a little bit about self-discovery earlier when I submitted my manuscript and this acquire editor, who you don't know who this person is from anybody. And it's just this black hole. You send it off to this acquiring editor and you wait like weeks. And then it comes back with pages of notes. And I'll tell you what, uh, thankfully for the weekly coaching that I had throughout this, throughout the entire year, every week there was workshops with the coach, the manuscript coach, as well as through the publishing journey. <laughs> I had to read those notes probably three times because my first reaction was, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> this story is amazing, you know, this kind of thing. And after I read it the second or third time, I realized, oh, that was kind of a weird right turn I took there. Maybe I need to just delete that one and save that for a blog or something in the future. And there were plenty of notes like that, that yeah. I was resistant to at first, but thankfully it, it I, I came to terms with it. Um, well, that's, you know, that's, that's why writing is, I mean, it is a humbling process, right? And you have to go into it knowing that, especially if it's your first book, right? Which this was for you. You have to understand that, hey, there are people who's, whose job it is, is to make books better. Um, and you need to almost let your ego take a, take a little back seat and, and accept the criticism and accept the direction because, you know, editors will tell you, you know, a lot of authors, there's some tension there. However, we're, what we're trying to do is make this person's book the best it can be to make it as marketable as it can be. And sometimes like, like I'm sure you're the same way, when I'm writing something, I can never find my own typos, right? And and the job of an editor isn't necessarily just to do that, you know, grammatical review or or, or, or looking at each line of copy. Um, it's to look at the content as a whole. But sometimes we're so close to our stories and, and what we're writing, the con we become blind to the to the blind spots in our own content, um, which you have to. But that that's one thing I always tell aspiring authors because I I informally coach you know people who who want to write books. Um, you know, you have to just be open to 
the advice that you're getting, not from your friends and family, because your friends and family are probably going to tell you that they love what you're doing. But as somebody who has no, no vested interest in your, in your success whatsoever, those are the people you need to listen to. I mean, I honestly, when I think about the journey, not only having all those, those coaches and editors along the way, but another important part of it was the beta readers and getting that feedback. And I have to tell you, I, through this journey, back to the self-discovery thing, I really learned about when you create something, I have a whole new appreciate, appreciation for creators. And you're really putting yourself out there and yeah. opening yourself up because a book is something very permanent, right? Once it's out there, it's out there and there isn't any changing to it, right? And you're promoting it and sharing ideas about it. And people can say whatever they want because you're putting it on social media and this kind of thing. And it's, it's a big moment of vulnerability. And I never thought about that as all, you know, think about any actors, you know, songwriters, whatever. It's a very vulnerable thing. And so it takes, it takes a lot to kind of get through that. And, and especially when that editor comes back and says, this is not good. <laughs> and, you know, sort of telling you your project's ugly kind of thing. And that hurt. And it took a little while to get over that. Once I got over that, it was much easier journey, but there was, it was a little sting in there for sure, but I'm glad oh, yeah, I had yeah. that guidance. Yeah. I mean, when I think about writing, I mean, I think of like three, three, three points on a triangle, right? There's, there's sort of the creativity and talent part that you have to have. That's like the baseline. You, you kind of have to have like a good idea going into it. Um, then you have to have, you know, the vulnerability, right? You have to, you have to be willing to be vulnerable um, in order to um, sort of in order to, to, to almost be authentic because you are putting yourself out there. You know, when you're, when you're, even if you're writing nonfiction, you're, you're putting a story out there um, that people are going to read and they're going to be, you know, they're, they're going to wonder, okay, well, what part of this could be true, <laughs> you know? Um, but you need to have that vulnerability because you might get a bad review. You know, you, you, you might get someone out there who, who says, hey, this is, this isn't great. And you have to be willing to, you have to be willing to do that. Um, and I know I mentioned three parts of the triangle. I have totally spaced on what that third part is, but if it comes to me, I will let you know. <laughs> please do, please do. Uh, <laughs> the, the other part about vulnerability, I think that is a powerful part of an, any, any book you're writing is putting it all out there because people don't want it. That's what connects people to books is like real true stories. And sometimes people aren't going to agree with you and they say, well, that was a stupid decision you made and whatever story you're trying to tell in your book, but you have to be prepared for that. But I, the more you can be vulnerable, I think the more you can really get a, a, a better buy-in from the reader and, and I think have a, a better mission, a better movement behind your book. Because uh, I remember vividly one of my beta readers, I had this whole section, there was a whole section of my book about how emotional intelligence plays a part in leadership. And each segment that I pulled out of emotional intelligence to say highlighted my story, I, had a, I literally had a story with each element, self-awareness and a, a few others. And one of them, I just wrote, kind of a, almost a Wikipedia definition of it. And my beta reader came back and he was like, why do you have this one in here? Uh, you know, an early reader, it, I don't resonate. This one doesn't resonate with me. And what I realized after a few more people gave me notes that I said, this one doesn't have a story. Mm -hmm. I just kind of defined it. Self-awareness is this, right? And once I added the story, then people were like, oh, I saw that. I know this Jeff guy from my co my coworker, Jeff. That's, who, that's exactly who this is about, you know, this kind of thing. Then they could connect to it. The story really brought it to life. Yeah, that, that's one thing I've learned, you know, in, in comedy clubs is um, when you're, when, you know, you think about why people laugh at, at something, right? And I'm thinking about like storyteller type comics, not like joke, you know, rapid fire, Jackie the Joke Man types. Um, but what people really laugh at are, are, are really what they identify with in, in whatever premise and punchline you have. And, you know, a good comedian will make themselves the butt of the joke. Um, but you're getting the belly laughs when, when you're identifying something that people can relate to because it's happened to them. And now all of a sudden they can take a step back and laugh at it. Um, you know, that's, so, so there's, there's that vulnerability of getting up on stage and, and sharing the story, but there's also being able to tie it into something that's kind of universal, you know, that we all, we've all had these embarrassing experiences and um, that when we, and we can laugh at that, but the storytelling is, I agree that, you know, being able to, to take a lesson and putting in, in the form of a story that someone can relate to makes it much more digestible. It's so important. And people relate to that, right? You're a real person. You're authentic. You've made mistakes too. Uh, and that's okay. It's what you learned from it, right? And that's yeah. the, key to the, the key to it. 
That's the key. Being willing to learn from mistakes. You know, also another, um, I think another uh, aspect of leadership that, um, you know, doesn't necessarily go uh, as, as widely publicized as, as it should be. You know, I think it especially, you know, um, I just remember there's so many times in my career where I'd be afraid to either A, ask for help or B, uh, admit that I did something wrong. Um, and it's kind of a shame because the, the most growth you have is when, when you kind of fall on your face and learn from that experience. And, and a good manager, good leader will identify that and, and kind of coach you through it. Um, you know, if you're fortunate to have a leader like that, but what's your take on, on that sort of learning from mistakes in, in leadership? I don't know if there's a better teaching tool than, you know, try some new stuff out, right? You've got to have your systems and processes in place, I think, to execute most of the time, but you've got to, back to the earlier point we talked about, you've got to find growth. You've got to find ways to evolve what it is you're doing. Otherwise, in one, three, five years, you'll be irrelevant. So you've got to try some new things. And you have to approach that from a point of, they're not all going to work, right? Uh, it's, it's not called innovation because it's perfect every time it comes out, right? There, there will be mistakes made along the way, but it's how you learn from that and how you create a culture in, within your team, within your organization to make that acceptable. And that all really starts with trust. And that's not something, you know, that's not on, on, uh, not on a lot of leadership manuals, like go build trust with your team. Like that, that's not, I never, no one ever handed me a document when I moved into leadership on Wall Street that said, go build trust with your team. No one told me that. It took me a while to figure that out. And a few bumps in the road and a few mistakes along the way to go, oh, they don't trust me yet. <laughs> How do I right. solve for that? I've got to get to know them better. I've got to give them credit. I've got to celebrate them. Uh, I've got to do these things. Uh, it, I've got to take their input and do something with it and be transparent. And that's how you build trust and get real buy-in and real people to, to, to join you in the change and evolution journey. And I think that's just so important, but it all starts with trust. Yeah. I want to go back to um, the sort of publishing model you followed, um, which uh, you know involved getting pre-sales uh, and before before a, before a publication, and I, it's something that I think is really interesting. And you know, we're talking about innovation. I mean, it's a very innovative model because it it removes some of the risk. You know, certainly from the publisher, if the publisher sees that okay, there is a lot of interest in this already, it just kind of helps them feel better about. You know, who they're taking a chance on, especially with a first-time author who doesn't have a strong platform or doesn't have a big following behind them. Um, how did you find your your 250 buyers? I'm I'm really curious as to you know uh, you know because you know I could count 10 people off the top of my head who would probably buy something pre-sale uh, because I'm related to all of them. But 250 is sort of a, an order of magnitude that uh, is um, you know it could be challenging. How did you find your buyers? So part of the process is one announcing that you're writing a book, putting it out there on social media and creating tremendous awareness. Uh, that's a big part of it. And your coach through that. But the three key pieces to me are, you know, consistent, connecting, concentrated. So consistently putting content out that looks very similar. So people, you know, you're building a brand around this look, this feel, this, whatever it is your thing is, maybe with some colors, things like this. Connecting is playing this game where you start to use relevant hashtags. I didn't, honestly, I thought hashtags were sort of like a joke before I got into this whole thing and realized, oh wait, people actually follow hashtags on leadership and innovation and things like this. So consistently putting stuff out there that looks pretty similar, has a consistent look and feel to it. Uh, using these hashtags, borrowing people from your book and tagging them on posts. Like here's a quote from this famous person I interviewed for my book. And then you tag them and suddenly it appears to their audience, right? That's another little great way to create leverage for yourself in this connecting game. And then the last one is concentrated, being very focused and concentrated on whatever it is I put out there, sends a message out to the world that, hey, this guy's about leadership and optimization or whatever your genre is. And I really tried to follow that model and it worked pretty effectively. Like and it's a 30 day presale and you, you know, you can't put two social media posts out over those 30 days. <laughs> it's like 30 plus. And yeah. you've got to create this immense awareness. You start, you do start with a list of people. So they, they have you part of the coaching is you've come up with a list of 200 names, which surprisingly I got to quicker than I thought. It took me a couple hours, but at first seemed like to your point, I have 10, but how do I get to 200? You start to think about different uh, places you've been, your schoolmates, friends from work, your old job cities you've lived in, like you can start to create these veins. And then as you find these people and they sort of get excited about what you're doing, you know, you sort of start to ask them for help. And the biggest thing I learned along the way 
Mike was reaching out to my interviewees mm -hmm. uh, and saying, hey, this book's coming out, my pre-sale's coming out. And this is my million dollar question right here. I called them all up and said, hey, this thing's coming out. I'm super excited about it. I really appreciate you bringing this richness that you brought to my book through your stories, interviews, what have you. I'm about to market this thing. Here's what I'm thinking about with this social media campaign. What would you do here if you were me? And then get really quiet. Yeah. And that question right there opened up, I don't know, 20 doors for me. Hey, uh, my friend has a podcast. Maybe I can introduce you to him. Huh? Great. <laughs> hey, I'm, I have 40,000 followers on Twitter. I could, you know, reshare this stuff for you. Awesome. Right. And have an idea in your back pocket when you go to them about what you want that ask to be, but let them talk first. And I found that to be an immensely powerful exercise. Yeah. No, that's, that's fantastic advice. Fantastic advice. Um, the one thing I've, I've realized just by doing this show, um, in addition to what I've learned from everyone I talk to <laughs> is, um, the, the episodes that get the most, um, downloads are not necessarily the ones with the biggest authors, you know, with, with the, with the biggest credentials behind them. You know, I'm talking New York times, best-selling authors, the ones that get the most traction are the ones, um, where my guest has shared to their network. Um, you know, uh, they might, they might have a book that's only sold 10,000 copies, but they've shared it to their network. They've retweeted, they've, you know, commented on Instagram by an order of magnitude, 10 times the number of downloads from, let's say, a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Um, not a knock on them, but but those who who sort of extend it out um, and share it um, are are the ones where I'm I'm finding anyway the 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 sort of most most success. Just you know, taking a selfish example here, but. Um, but yeah, asking, asking, asking them for help, right? I mean, that's what it is. It's say, what would you do if you were me? Kind of asking for their advice. And then they have got that, that sort of, hey, um, they've invested some time in, in helping you because they participated in an interview already. And now it's sort of helping, helping you amplify it. That's fantastic. I'm going to take that statement a half a step further because there's an important wrinkle that you're tiptoeing around, but I want to make this point very clear because I think it's a super important one. It's all about alignment, right? They are totally aligned with you because if they help you sell more of your books, guess what? They're the lead story in chapter four. So they're really telling their own story. And it took me a while to recognize that as I went through my own marketing journey. And one day I asked someone this question. It was a very smart friend of mine, this woman, Nicole, uh, who I interviewed for the book, who's just an amazing uh, person. And I, I asked her that question, what would you do here if you were me? And she just came back to me with like 10 ideas. And I was like, I didn't think of any of those. And I was like, how do I do this at scale? So I literally reached out to all my interviewees. And suddenly doors just started to open up. Uh, and many times what happened was the thing, I would do a little research first to see maybe how could, instead of just leaving it up to this person to help me, maybe I could have a specific ask in my back pocket kind of thing, but let them talk first. Many times, like whatever my best idea was, they'd come back and offer it to me. Yeah. And I didn't end up not even have to ask. And if someone offers something to you, uh, as opposed to you asking for it, it's a very different level of ownership. And I would say there's a very similar model to leadership, by the way. And this is very much uh, one of the stories in my book. Wow. It, it all comes full circle. Doesn't it? Um, I, knew, I knew we'd get there. <laughs> <laughs> so you're involved now with, with helping coach other authors through this process. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. All right. So what, what, um, what do you find, you know, when, when authors are coming to you, what do you think they're most surprised with when, when you introduce them to this model, when you coach them through it? Um, what are some of the things that, that you're hearing that, um, you know, they're, they're typically surprised by? Uh, one, that they can actually raise this money. Two, that they have a story that anyone's going to want to hear. So there's this enormous imposter syndrome thing, like no one's going to care about this story. Why would I, who, who am I going to write this for? And who's going to buy this? Uh, so can I get this fundraising thing done? And is anybody going to care? I think those are probably the two biggest ones I run into and putting themselves out there, this vulnerability thing we talked about, I have to go announce this to the world. And that's kind of a scary moment. Um, yeah. So those are probably the big hurdles I see commonly. And this is done um, as kind of group coaching, right? I mean, this is done in a, in a small community or, of sorts. Exactly. Yeah. Weekly sessions with, you know, the, the groups are usually 30 to 50 on Zoom for like an hour mm -hmm. on a Tuesday night or whatever. And how, how important is that community aspect of it for, for those who are going through it? I mean, do, do, do these people like gel and, and collaborate with each other almost like 
you know, small writing groups do? Um, do they lean on each other for emotional support? Like what's, what's the role of interaction be between these participants? I would tell you that the community aspect is everything. You, we talked earlier about the, the aspect of all these coaches and editors as kind of guideposts. The emotional journey not only is helped by some of those folks, but it's really by that community. Um, I tried to quit my book twice very hard, Mike. <laughs> and it was really my peers and my cohort that kind of said, hey, you know, sort of, and the editors, but uh, all of the above really helped me along because you'd have this hour long call with these people in a group setting. And then there's often breakout sessions at the end with maybe five or 10 of you in that little breakout room or whatever. But then as you got to know these people, you, I'd set up one-on-one -on -one calls with them. Like, hey, can we talk next Wednesday at nine or whatever? And I'd love to brainstorm with you further. And so it was this constant journey of learning for me and being curious and uh, just really engaging with all these folks. And I couldn't imagine doing it without the community. I really couldn't. Yeah, it's almost like... Um... Yeah, I know people go on like weight loss journeys and, you know, they, they find themselves, you know, more successful if they are doing it with a group of people to hold themselves accountable to it. It's really the accountability. I think that that is the, you know, part of the secret sauce there anyway, um, sure. of, of making any kind of life change like that, or, or showing up at the gym. Cause you're, you don't want to disappoint X, Y, you know, this other person, but yeah, you got five um, interviews for your book this week. I got zero. I got to get going, right? This, you know, you wrote two thousand yeah. words this yes last two days. I need to get going, like this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, the little little peer pressures. Peer pressure isn't always negative, right? Yeah, it's not always negative. To motivate. Uh, well, I have some hot seat questions here for you, uh, John. <laughs> um, so we we need to. Uh, I, I try and ask these of of all of my guests just to, so I can find some common themes. Uh, first one. Uh, is is on the easier side of things. So, John, when you were a, a, a kid, what were some of the things that you were watching on TV? What what were some of your favorite TV shows as a kid? I feel like there were a few, but the one that sort of stands out in my mind is for some reason Beverly Hillbillies. I don't know why I always liked Oof. that show as a kid. <laughs> you know, I think it's the theme song. Um, it's it's that was the golden age of TV. Um, well, maybe just slightly after the golden age of TV, but. But back then, I remember because that's one of those shows that I watched, you know, in reruns um, when my uh, my brother and I would go to, to Florida to visit my grandparents and they had three TV channels. You know, they didn't have cable. And, you know, one of them was I think it was TBS and Beverly Hillbillies, Bonanza, Petticoat Junction, The Munsters, all of these shows. That's what we would watch. And uh, I'm telling you, the, the the theme song is what drew me into that show. And, and theme songs are just, they just don't exist on TV anymore. And I think that's a crime. I totally agree. But yeah, right. that one, that show really got me for some reason. Beverly Hillbillies. I mean, what is it? Like the, the, the promise of, of like the, th where the, the, the fish out of water aspect of it, um, which always leads to humor or, or what, what do you suppose? I think for me, it was more the fact that kind of, here's these people that have all these sort of hurdles against them. They live in this rural America place and yet they can find a way to make it big. Granted, it was sort of a big luck shot thing that, you know, the oil, right? right. But I think for me, it was like, it was almost inspirational in the sense that maybe because I grew up in a small town and kind of a middle income family, like if, uh, I can think bigger. And I think that's kind of what drew me in. Like there's a bigger outcome for people than maybe you could imagine. Yeah, there you go. Um, how about this? Yeah, you're a teenager now. Uh, we found you, um, in your teenage years, what albums or cassettes would we find you listening to? Steve Miller, the police, uh, probably Pink Floyd that maybe that came a little later in college, mm -hmm. uh, probably in that genre, the Grateful yeah. Dead. Nothing wrong with Steve Miller. Um, I, I just listened to an interview with him recently and, uh, Fasc fascinating story. He is a very probably underrated guitar player. Um, you know, you you know, you you'd never compare him to, let's say, like a David Gilmore from Pink Floyd, right? Um, but uh, one thing I learned from uh, Steve Miller's story was that um, his godfather was Les Paul, and I um, I probably wouldn't have put those two together, but I thought that was pretty interesting. Never knew that. Fun fact: Steve Miller was my first live concert. Oh, really? Yeah. Very cool. Where where was uh, where did the concert take place? Alpine Valley, right outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. All right. Alpine sadly, Valley. sadly, the place where Steve Ray Vaughan played and then crashed his helicopter. Oh night. man, that was what 87, 88, maybe. Um, I think it was early nineties. Was it the early nineties? I could remember. A group remember. of my friends went to that show, and for some reason, I had to cancel at the last minute, and then that was the night that 
he crashed. It was crazy. Yeah, I had just started to get into Stevie Ray Vaughan around that time because I, I had taken up the guitar and uh, one of the, the kids who I was playing with, um, yeah, he Stevie Ray Vaughan was was one of his idols. And um, I remember listening to him. I, I could never, ever in a million years play like him. But I remember hearing about the, um, the, the helicopter crash right after. Right, it, it was a benefit. I think it was a benefit concert for... Um, it was it for Eric Clapton's. Um, oh, no, I can't remember. It was, but but it was. I just remember just like so many. We lost so many musicians in helicopter and plane crashes. Crazy, <laughs> just uh, horrible. Um, all right. Uh, what advice would you give to the, these? Were the questions might get a little harder. What advice would you give to uh, somebody who sits down in front of you and says, you know, John, I'd, I'd like to write a book. I've never done it before. What are some words of advice you might uh, might give that person? Uh, Think about the, the new idea you're bringing to the world, right? Great books are about tension. Like they bring some new thought to the world, like Dan Pink's new book, Regret, right? I'm reading that right now. And he has this great line in there. He sets the whole book up with Edith Piloff and how she was this amazing artist. And she always uh, was making life very difficult for anyone around her to really, you know, wait. You, she'd have to wait an hour to meet with her, this kind of thing. And then she died young. And everyone, he sets it up with this whole, oh, we should, we should live life with no regrets. And all these people have these no regrets tattoos, right? And his thing is, his tension is, that's, that's a great way in, to sort of in folly and for fun to think about it, but you're dead wrong. He literally uses those words. You're absolutely wrong. And it's, what is that tension? What is that sort of common belief that's held out there? And how is your view different? And uh, really help people kind of distill down what that is. Super important part about a book. And that's where it needs to start. And then you can build from there. Don't get caught up on writing chapter one through eight. Like, let's figure out what it is we're really digging into here and then begin the story, the, the writing dream. Yeah, no regrets. I, I always, <laughs> as somebody, there's like a meme that goes around the internet where somebody gets one of those no regrets tattoos, but it's spelled wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I always thought that was so funny because, you know, <laughs> what, what are you going to regret more than a tattoo that says no regrets, but it's spelled wrong? <laughs> I think there was a movie that made fun of that. I'm trying to forget what it was right now. I think, I think you're, I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. That's it's, um, you know, maybe it'll come to us before the end of our time together here. Um, uh, number four is how do you feel when you're looking at a blank computer screen or a blank piece of paper, depending on how you write, you've got the intention that you need to write something. You want to write something. How do you feel when, when you just have that blank page in front of you? It depends on how much pre-work I did before I sat down there. If I have that kind of outline going sort of in my notes, it usually feels pretty good. Like I'm going to get this going. And this is, this was a big lesson learned for me through the writing journey. If I don't have that pre-work done, that blank page just makes me anxious and uncomfortable. <laughs> like, Oh dear God, isn't, how do I fill up this page? <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe then maybe that's part of the words of advice to give to a budding author is, you know, don't, you know, work, work from an outline, you know, work with some kind of idea of what it is you're, you're trying to say with some kind of structure to it. Yeah. Um, I really fought the coaching early on. I really did. To your point earlier about this is my book, stop telling me what to do kind of thing. I kind of took that approach. And finally, one day, I, I, something light bulb went off and I started to follow the structure in this pre-work and you know, chapters just started appearing in front of me. I was like, why have I been fighting this for so long? All right. You know, so trust the process, I guess I'd say. Find a good coach and trust the process. Yeah, there was, there was a story... I remember hearing um, about Dave Grohl, uh, who uh, obviously the lead singer of the Foo Fighters, drummer of Nirvana. But back in the Nirvana days, I mean, he was you know, Dave was known as a very good drummer. Um, but he always found that in, during recording sessions, like he would mistakenly change the tempo, you know, ever so slightly. And somebody, one of the producers said to him, you know, Dave, drum to a click track. Um, because, you know, it'll 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 you'll be amazed. You, they'll, you'll be on time all the time. And he resisted and resisted. Once he finally started drumming to a click track, he realized, hey, this isn't cheating. This actually is helping me and it's making a recording more efficient. So, you know, when, when you said that, you know, kind of resisting coaching, um, you know, that, that story just immediately kind of came to my mind. It's like, again, like these are people who have your best interest at heart. You know, they, they, and they know what they're doing because they've been doing it for a longer period of time. So just kind of embrace that, embrace that advice almost. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know, but somebody else might, that's why you're working with them. Right. <laughs> right. Um, you know, talking about, you know, we talked about failure before and, and that being sort of the, you know, our best teacher, um, any lessons in, in life, any big lessons in life you've learned, whether it's publishing or, or elsewhere, 
um, that you had to learn through failure, or, or as I like to say, you had to learn the hard way? Well, it's, it's hard to pick a favorite story for this one, buddy. Uh, <laughs> there are many, uh, you know, uh, all those years I worked on Wall Street, I remember uh, when I finally got the big job that I wanted as a sales guy, kind of a crown jewel sales job that I, I got, had a great five or six years that I ran up. This is in Florida, early 2000s. And I had a, they gave me the smallest territory in the company. And, uh, you know, I couldn't make it any worse, basically, was I think the idea. <laughs> so five or six years, I took off running and grew like crazy. And then about six or seven years in, I kind of kind of plateaued. And I kept making excuses. Oh, it's because the market, it's because the economy, or it's because of this or that. And I'm sitting at the, uh, the conference at some fancy hotel, and they have this award ceremony. And they go to announce one of the awards I could have won. And they announced the winner. And it, of course, wasn't me. And it was that moment then and there that I realized I wasn't even in the running and I've been deluding myself for months upon months. And, you know, the, a, a great quote I found from my book, I, I'll never forget is the worst lies we tell her to ourselves. And I'll never forget that moment and realizing, wow, I've been deluding myself this whole time. So if things aren't going the way you want, I think the lesson here I'm trying to go for is like, don't be afraid to look inside a little bit and say, maybe there's something that you can change, right? We always look for these things that we have no control over to change, right? I'm going to, the economy is a big problem. What control do I have over the economy right? mm -hmm. or, or inflation or some war in the world, not to trivialize war, but right. There's always these things. And, you know, many times when there's challenges, it's sort of looking into that mirror and saying, what can I do here to change this? And I'll tell you what, I went out and asked someone for help after that. I asked a friend, what would you do here if you were me? And he gave me a great, he said, go out and ask your clients for feedback. Mm -hmm. And man, I went out and did that. And it changed the trajectory of my career. My business took off. I, the following year, 12 months later, I sat on the stage and won the biggest award the company came out. And that was a massive inflection point for my career. Yeah. Yeah. There's that vulnerability thing again, right? Asking, you know, somebody who, who, you know, you're doing business with to give you some feedback. Um, and then taking, and then having the courage or, or sort of the strength to take their advice and, and put it into action. But clearly it had some results for you. Some people think about vulnerability as a weakness. And I would tell you, my experience is it's a strength. And cause I can tell you, I asked some clients for feedback and they told me stories I didn't want to hear. Mm -hmm. And that was, <laughs> there were some painful moments there, but this is how we grow. Right. And it gave me this brilliant, uh, their advice gave me this brilliant start, stop, continue exercise. Right. I need to stop doing this. I need to start doing this. And this, this other thing I'm doing is going great. I'm going to keep pushing on that and really, but it took that vulnerability. It took that uh, willingness to ask for help and boy, did it have a great impact on my life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did, you know, I did, 10 or so episodes ago, I had one entitled, you know, vulnerability is not a weakness. And, um, you know, you almost said the exact quote that, that my guest had said, which is, you know, vul vulnerability is not weakness. I'm one of the strongest people you'll ever meet. Um, so that was, uh, fascinating. And last one up here is, uh, I call it the Brad Paisley letter to me exercise because it's inspired by his, uh, song letter to me, where of course he writes a letter to his younger self, gives himself all sorts of insights and advice. So, if you could do the same, write a letter to your younger self, what, what kind of an insights or advice would you share uh, with the younger John Saunders? You know, I think life is about a, a rich life, a life well, not with money, but a life well lived and one that's enjoyable, I think is about learning lots of different things and knowing lots of different things. So I would, I would tell myself, my 15, 18 year old self, go keep trying different things. You know, I would sort of join one thing and sort of run with that soccer or whatever it was. And I would just do those few things. Uh, try lots of different things, continue to experiment, get to know more people, learn their stories, travel the world. Like life gets better with more experiences. And it also gives you a better perspective on the world. And I, I think I've made a lot of progress on what I'm talking about now, but I don't think I had this mindset, you know, 30 yeah. years ago. Very good. Well, I know your book is The Optimizer, Building and Leading a Team of Serial Innovators. Where if people wanted to buy uh, that book, John, where could they go and do so? Yeah, certainly anywhere you buy books online, Amazon or my website. Uh, it's just my name, John C. Saunders, S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S.com. And I'm sure we've inspired at least one person out there to uh, who, who might be thinking about writing uh, writing a book or taking the first steps to, to doing so. Uh, where could they learn more uh, about the co coaching services um, that you offer? Uh, on my website or uh, the creator.institute as well. The creator.institute. Any, any social media uh, handles you want to throw out there in case people are interested in 
following you on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, any of those fun places. Yeah. LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. I'm on all those at uh, JCS, my initials, JCS Optimizer, the book title. Very good. Well, John, uh, anything else you want to share with the audience before we say goodbye? You know, creation is an incredibly powerful force. And if you want to find something in interesting to do in life, I go back to this early woman's advice, uh, go immerse yourself in something and create something out of that. And I think you'll find a great outcome from that. There you go. Can't think of a better sentiment to end on. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Mike. I really enjoyed it.